I'm Mike Davis. I'm uh, here to talk about hacking or HackRF. Louder? Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, I'll just shout a bit. I'm a little bit hungover and i uh, got a bit of a cold, so, you know, uh, my voice is a bit deep. But yeah, so I'm talking about hacking or HackRF. Um, basically, the idea is to show you guys how to take a HackRF apart a little bit and maybe modify it and do, make it do some things it's uh, not supposed to, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, I am Elastic Ninja on Twitter, Mike Davis. Um, I'm doing a master's in um, information security. And uh, yeah, I love hacking stuff. I'm, I've done a lot of hardware talks and uh, I built this badge as well. So yeah, you can talk to me about that later if you want. Um, okay, so what is a hacker rep? Um, so I've actually got my hacker rep apart on the table in front of me here. And it's a pretty sketchy uh, setup there, but that's that's a hacker ref uh, pretty much open. Um, it's a software-defined radio, and you can get it from Great Scott Gadgets. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> it's quite a nice, accessible device. Uh, it's three hundred and thirty dollars, I think, and it's open-source hardware, which is why I get all excited about it. So, oops. So one of the fun things about a hacker app, if you want to change it, is actually taking it apart. Um, the first time I did it, uh, there were a lot of bad cracking noises, and um, it, uh, it, I actually broke the case. Um, I used the tool on the left, and if you go search on uh, the internet, there's quite a few talks about um, how to actually do it the proper way. And the best way is to use um, uh, Jared Boone, Sharebrain's um, little guitar pick, and he's got a very specific type, so you can just go buy one at the at the store, and the thing just pops open. So it's actually done a, a 10 second video on it. So that's what you can look at. <clears throat> so here's a map of the world of, of the internals of the hacker app. <clears throat> um, on that top right, top right hand section is just RF and dragons, and like don't fiddle there. Um, there's not a lot you can do in there, but you can uh, change it in software. So uh, that's the interesting part, but I'm going to focus on the other side of it. Um, which is basically everything from the RF section onwards. Um, if you go have a look at the baseband header, you can get the, the raw 20 mega sample, megahertz rather, uh, baseband. Both the transmit and the receiver is in there. The only problem I have with that header is I don't think it's a good RF header. So you probably, if you want to do something with that, you probably want to replace it or um, maybe put something with better contacts in it. Um, this is the CPLD. It does a lot of the heavy lifting, uh, decimation, and Moving the data from the, um, so I didn't mention the front end, which is the little chip on the bottom left there. And that does the, that samples the, the raw baseband and turns it into digital data. So that's the, actually the, the bit that you, um, uh, gives you the digital part of the STR. Um, so the CPLD is a kind of like a, uh, I like to call it a weak FPGA, but that's not really what it is. It's a logical device. Um, you can program it to map. I mean, in this case, I think it's mapping pins between um, the front end and the uh, um, and the actual processor. So it does decimation and does a whole bunch of other RF type uh, activities. Um, and then you've got the actual microcontroller itself with all the headers, and that's the bit that uh, that's pretty interesting for me. Um, and if you take a look at this, this is a great fat. So they've actually chopped the Hacker up in half, and just giving you that bit on the left there um, in a slightly different format, a slightly different chip as well. But if you ask them about the great bit, um, it's quite a nice little device. I think they've done a lot of talks on uh, like infrared and all that kind of thing. And basically, you can also use it for as a kind of logic analyzer as well if you want. Uh, so that's quite a cool thing. Um, so most of the work I've done has been in this little section here. Uh, it involves a lot of this, a lot of this kind of thing, breadboards and little wires sticking all over the place. Um, I've seen someone did a very nice PCB to join two hacker refs together. Uh, it was an academic project, and I'll try and find that link, but um, it's really cool what they did. They worked on the CPLD side and modified that to synchronize two hacker refs. Um, I focused on the processor side, and I failed. So anyway, I had a good time doing it. Um, so, like I said before, one of the great things about the hacker app is that it's, uh, it's open source hardware. They publish all the schematics. 
um, and you can go have a look through it and really you can go to Michael Osmond's uh, GitHub and just have a look at the um, have a look at an uh, KiCad. So when you open a KiCad, that's the kind of view you get. Um, you can see all the traces between the different components, and if you do a little bit of work, you can just get rid of all the layers that you don't care about, and instead focus on the processor and the headers for for this particular thing. Um, the data sheet for the processor that they use is really hard to like. If you look for the pinouts, it's somewhere in the middle of the of the document, and I, I can never find it. I wanted to put it on the page here, but uh, basically the um, uh, uh, most of the pins that you would be interested in are actually mapped to the the headers. But um, yeah. So, uh, so the question is: Is it just op open source hardware, and uh, are multiple manufacturers manufacturing it? Um, so, Grayscale Gadgets designed it and and make it, and I believe there's a thing called a Blue RF. Or something like that, which is cheaper and uses cheaper components and breaks more often. And occasionally, if you ask them very nicely, they'll fix it for you. But I wouldn't recommend using it, um, especially because um, it's literally a clone that's using cheaper parts. So uh, I'd rather support um, uh, Great Scott gadgets. But there are—I mean, you could make it yourself. So I'll talk a little bit later about what I want to do and how I want to change it. And uh, so I'll be kind of—I'll be making a few myself, and then. Making it open source as well. Yep. Um, okay, so it's got a. I didn't put the name on it. Uh, LPC forty three twenty is on the hacker ref. Uh, like I said, that data sheet is terrible uh, in terms of just trying to find the pinout. Usually, it's the first ten pages, but in this case, I, I checked last night. I couldn't actually find it. Um, but it has everything you need in there for to to do what you want to do. It's got two cores in it. It's got an M4, which is a reasonably powerful kind of processor, and then it's got a little uh, M0 sitting on the side. Um, that is, it's kind of difficult to get them to communicate, but you can actually pass data between them. So that's useful for things like driving displays and doing all that kind of thing, while the main processor does a lot of the hard work. Um, as I'll show you later, uh, there's DMA in the, uh, as you'd expect from a modern processor, and a lot of the hacker apps, uh the main loop in the hacker app doesn't actually do anything. So most of the work's done in DMA. So if you want to fiddle in there, it's a little bit of assembly and that kind of thing. So, but it's not a lot of code. Um, it can drive an SD card, can drive Ethernet, it's got ADCs and DACs, so you can do things like sample microphones and output speakers and that kind of thing. That's pretty cool. Uh, and it's got all the rest of the kind of things you may expect. Um, just quick overview of all the different headers. Um, there's, there's four headers. Uh, this P22, it's got stuff like the clocks and uh, SPI, you can see in the bottom left there. Um, I, don't folk, I don't use those very often. Uh, P28 headers, these are all the ones that are surrounding the, the actual processor. Um, again, this is uh, SD card stuff. Um, there's your baseband header. And like I said, I'm not sure, I haven't tried it, but I'm not sure that that's actually. I'm not sure that you'd actually be able to get the quality of signal that you want out of it, but I, like, I haven't really tried it. So, um, yeah. And this is the one that I normally I normally play with. It's got a, a whole bunch of things. It's got the um, you can get uh, push voltage into it. You can get voltage out of it. Uh, a lot of ground pins and a whole bunch of GPIO pins that are kind of useful. Okay, so the firmware is also open source, so you can. Just go to Michael Osmond's uh, uh, GitHub repo and you can play with the firmware. Um, so, as I said before, the typical main loop is just setting up uh, USB mainly, and then um, and then just sitting in a while true. So it doesn't really do a lot. Normally, I take this out and replace it with something else. Um, and in this case, I want to show off a little the the typical kind of hello world, which is a blinky light, blinky LED. I believe so, but I'll tweet them out. Elastic Ninja will make it easy. Uh, 
Have you got it? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if, if you if you want to uh, typically if you want to blink a light, you have to interact with uh, GPI opens, so general purpose I opens. Um, in this case, it's neatly wrapped up in uh, for the. Anyway, they've got three LEDs in the front of the hacker app, so this is neatly wrapped up in a little LED on, LED off, and LED toggle. And uh, and so you can literally just, for Hello World, replace the, the whole main loop with just LED on, delay for half a second, LED off, and delay again. And uh, I'm going to try my best not to break this. So you can see the green light, I hope. And that is currently blinking. <laughs> um, so that's basically that code there, just um, just blinking in every half second or so. Okay, so when you program the device, um, normally there's the HackRF SPI flash, and that just interacts with the USB and then pushes that uh, pushes your your binary into the flash chip. And then, it, you know, as soon as you reboot, it loads off that and it's fine. But I tend to remove the USB handling because most of what I'm doing doesn't actually have USB attached to it. Um, so after breaking the USB, you have to use DFU util. And it's super easy. You just push the DFU button on the, on the front, reset it, and then it's in DFU mode. And that'll get it into, uh, it'll get your code onto the device. Um, getting it back is an interesting exercise in git reset and that kind of thing. Okay, so um, that's the typical loop that I, I, I mean, that's the base of the loop. So the question is, how do you break USB or why does it break? Um, uh, where was that code? So this is the actual main loop in the, in the normal code. And as you can see, there's, there's two sets of uh, USB kind of transfer code, and it runs that continuously. And as soon as you take that out, I think it's within a couple of seconds the device uh, it, it times out and it stops responding to USB in terms of the, the host actually, um, I've forgotten the word, but disconnects it. Uh, so it's very quickly not useful as a USB device. I mean, you can leave this stuff in here, um, but if there's no USB device connected while your stuff is running, weird things happen. So I, I just take it out. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I did the blinky demo, sorry. Uh, right, so obviously you want to do something useful with a hacker app. You don't want to just blink an LED. Well, you may want to do that, but um, so there's quite a few interesting other open source projects. There's the Porter Pack, uh, which I'll describe later. Uh, I've got a badge that I wrote, so I use some of that code. Um, and if you dig around in the hacker app code itself, there's a lot of uh, a lot of bits of code that actually access the, the hardware in interesting ways. So like the, there's a blinky demo in the actual hacker app source code. So um, you can go dig around there, have a look, but Porter Pack is actually the thing to look at if you want to build something that's not a, uh, a host-based SDR, you know, or a host-connected host SDR. Um, and I'll show you that just now. One of the more interesting things about what I've been doing is trying to power a hacker app without blowing it up. So what I like to do is push it into the USB bus, um, which means that I r run the risk of blowing up my computer when I program it. But if you're careful enough, you can basically power it off. Uh, you put uh, five volts into the V bus, and then uh, it manages the rest itself. So uh, you can even, can't really plug a battery in there. There is actually a V bat uh, pin, but I haven't tried that. I'm not actually sure what that does. But it it says battery. Sorry. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. <laughs> but um, if you want it, you really need to give it five volts and then it's, everything's happy. So, um, okay, so I, I built a, a shaky demo. It basically, um, I'll show you the code now, but it sits in a loop and it, ba um, it pulls, pulls the 2.4 gig spectrum into little bins and then tries to display it on my little badge here. So I did it in my hotel room. It's a little bit sketchy, but it kind of works. Also, the contrast is a bit rubbish. I don't know if you can all see that. But so in theory, that's the 2.4 spectrum. Uh, just doing a waterfall down here. So again, the Porter Pack does a much better job of this. Um, and it's a really nice sort of um, device. But uh, if you wanted to put a display on, 
There's also display drivers uh, on the, well, there's a display uh, peripheral on the actual hacker app as well, so you could plug that in too. Um, so this is just a bit banged SPI talking to my badge. Okay. Anyway. Um, so the reason I started all of this was I wanted to have multiple hacker apps um, synchronized so I could do TX and RX or I could do uh, like multiple, so the whole band of Wi-Fi or uh, in the one case it was uh, direction finding. So that was my actual intent and the reason I started taking my devices apart. I also have far too many hacker apps because I was trying to do that kind of thing. So um, uh, if you want to buy one. Anyway, um, but uh, so it was relatively simple. It's just like basically plugging a few GPIOs in together and synchronizing the clocks. So you'll see, you'll see on the hacker if there's two ports on the back and those are for, um, for accepting or transmitting a clock. And um, the clock in the hacker app is not that great. So it drifts a bit. I think it's a, it's just a standard or relatively standard crystal and it's got 20 to 100 ppm kind of um, accuracy. So there are um, changes you can make to it to get much better. So doing things like GPS and that kind of thing you can actually do with a hacker app but you need to do a lot of work. But anyway, so um, the problem with this approach is you've got multiple USB ports that you have to synchronize and it turns out that synchronized USB is actually a terrible idea. So it doesn't actually work but it uh, for very low bandwidth signals you can actually get away with it. So the, the difference between the time of arrival of packets and that kind of thing is actually, it's, you can get away with it. But um, I gave up on that project uh, and I started thinking about cutting a hacker up in half. And uh, so the idea is that what I want to do is take the RF section one side, not physically cutting it, sorry, but uh, I don't know what would happen, but taking the RF section on one side and putting the processing section on another and then hopefully making little boards that I could plug the, uh, you plug multiple RF sections into and, and then the discussion becomes what kind of processor do you use and how do you get all that data across so then all of a sudden I'm working with USB 3, and FPGAs and that kind of thing. So um, I've kind of, uh, kind of put it on the shelf for now but I've still, I still dream about it. It's like something I'd really like to do. Um, and there is actually a great Scott Gadget board out there that does multiple, it can do, uh, it adds another radio section to the hacker app. Um, I've gone and forgotten the name of it, um, but it's a work in progress and I think that might be the easier path, I'm not sure. But um, so if you have a look around at the, um, at Michael Osmond's GitHub repo, you'll actually find it there. Like all of the boards, the great pet and everything are there. So um, if you wanted to go and make one and give me one, that'd be great. But um, anyway, so that's a project I'm working on. Um, I also fly drones. And uh, that's a picture of my drone hanging off a wire that I, it took me ages to get, out of, get it off of there. But um, one of my projects is actually to put hacker apps uh, or a, one hacker app that I'm willing to risk onto a drone and use it in place of um, uh, the FPV gear that, I, that you can buy commercially. So uh, the FPV gear that you can buy commercially is pretty shockingly bad stuff. Um, it's an FM modulated um, uh, video signal and it doesn't do well with you know, interference, it doesn't do well with a bad antenna. So I thought maybe I could do better. So I've been strapping hacker up onto it and trying to receive the signal and I'm, I'm getting somewhere, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm always worried about that, you know, landing up on, on something and then my hacker up is, you know, gone. So anyway, um, so all of the things I've been talking about are kind of encapsulated in the porta pack. Um, you can buy it at uh, at the vendor area. It's got a little screen. It's got buttons. It's got um, it's got a battery. It's got all the things in there. Um, I haven't bought one because I like to break stuff myself. But uh, this thing's pretty cool if that's all you're looking for. Okay, um, yeah, and that. It's pretty much my talk. So, yeah.